Okay, so I think we'll get started. So hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We really appreciate you taking the time to join in today's webinar. Uh, I'm Matt Hamilton. I, I work for the Government of Canada, but I'm also co-chair of the Global Methane Initiative's Biogas Subcommittee, along with uh, the United States and Ghana as co-chairs. Uh, so thank you so much for, for tuning in. We've got some really good presentations lined up uh, all around the subject of the opportunities and strategies for addressing landfill methane uh, at open dumps and, and landfills around the world. So um, before we get going with the presentations, I believe uh, there's some messages we were going to share at the start from, from APT Associates. Did you want to go ahead, Catherine? Yep. Uh, thanks, Matt, and thanks everyone for joining today. I'm just going to go over a few brief uh, webinar software tips before we get started. Um, so first, there are two ways to connect with the audio today. You can either listen through your computer speakers or you can use the number that is posted on this webinar slide. Um, all participant lines will be muted for the duration of the webinar, regardless of the audio method that you choose. Uh, so we will be using two panels for today's webinar, the participant panel and the question and answer panel. Both of these can be found on the right hand side of your screen. You may need to click the arrow next to the desired panel to expand and see all of the content. Um, and if for some reason one of them does not appear, you can navigate to the bottom right of your screen and click on the ones that you are missing. Um, throughout the duration of the webinar, you can enter questions into the Q&A panel. So when submitting questions, please select all panelists from the drop down menu before hitting send, uh, as this will ensure that all of the speakers can see your question. The questions will be moderated at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session and the final materials, um, including the slides and the recording, will be posted to the GMI website. So with that, I'll pass it back to Matt. Thank you so much. That's really useful. So we'll get started with our first presentation. Uh, so today we've got uh, Aditi Ramola talking to us. She's, uh, she's the technical director at the International Solid Waste Association, where she manages international projects and partnerships with the UN, provides assistance to ISWA's working groups, and also helps develop innovative projects globally to further strengthen cooperation with ISWA's partners and international organizations. Her skills are particularly focused on solid waste management and environmental issues. Uh, Aditi holds a master's in environmental technology and international affairs from the Vienna University of Technology. She has several years of experience in the private sector, including at Caterpillar Incorporated before joining uh, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization in the in the Climate Policy and Networks Unit. DC is also passionate about science education and was the founding member and lead of the ISWA Young Professionals Group Initiative on Education and is the past chair of the ISWA Young Professional Group. In 2016, she helped launch the regional ISWA Young Professional Group in India. So Aditi, uh, please take it away. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to be joining you today at this session on global opportunities and strategies for addressing landfill methane. And uh, before I start, I would like to thank the teams at GMI, Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as the US EPA for coming together with ISWA to organize this four part series. And I would also like to thank the team at APT Associates for all the help and support that they've given for facilitating this webinar. So before we get into the topic itself, I'd like to introduce uh, the International Solid Waste Association, ISWA. Um, ISWA, believe it or not, was founded in 1970, and it's a global independent not profit association that promotes sustainable, comprehensive and professional waste management globally and it's also promoting a transition to a circular economy. Uh, we are a member-based organization and we are open to individuals as well as entities and um, organizations as well as institutes from all around the world that are working on the topic of waste management. And um, we work on a range of issues within the waste management sector through our working groups and uh, task forces. For instance, we have a working group on climate uh, and waste, uh, organic waste management, healthcare waste management, recycling and waste minimization, landfills, etc. We have 10 such working groups and several task forces 
that are set up to address topics that are cross-cutting uh, along general thematic lines or areas. And one such uh, task force that we have is um, a task force on closing open dump sites. And I'm going to talk to you more about this during my presentation. Um, and just uh, to end the slide, our general secretariat is based in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And uh, if you want more information about the work that we do and the projects that we carry out globally, uh, you may visit our website at www.iswa.org. Um, next slide, please. So um, moving into the topic of solid waste and why I've put that in brackets is because it's as opposed to liquid or water waste. Um, here we're talking more about solid waste and currently estimates and studies suggest that over 2.5 billion people lack access to basic waste services. And when I say basic waste services, that's just collection, uh, any kind of treatment and so on. And between 30 to 40 percent of the waste that's generated globally is openly dumped and burned and finally leaked into the waterways and the environment, uh, which then reaches the oceans. You can see pictures that I've put up on the slide. Um, these are actually pictures that, you know, are quite common in the global south. Um, and what we know from estimates and studies is that waste generation is expected to increase over the next decades. And most of this projected increase in municipal solid waste generation is going to be due to a combination of GDP and population growth. And it's going to be different in different parts of the world. So depending on the context, it's going to you know, show different trends, but essentially this is what it's going to be. And more uh, in-depth analysis of this uh, is going to be launched in a report next month. Um, improper waste management essentially is uh, linked to a lot of challenges. And so if we go to the next uh, slide, please. Um, we essentially see that there are health impacts. There are also um, impacts of, uh, you know, on environment and there is not enough clear data on how much open burning actually takes place because it's actually a very uh, localized practice, but widely practiced across the globe, at least in the global south. And it obviously happens due to uh, lack of waste infrastructure, collection services, and so on. And um, these open dumping, open burning, um, they create serious health impacts, as I said, for people who are, of course, living in and around uh, these sites but also communities uh, that are working um, at these sites for their livelihoods. And it affects the livelihoods of many, many people, uh, millions of people around the globe. And um, what kind of pollution does this have, you know, does this lead to? We have water pollution. There are um, emissions of toxic greenhouse gas, uh, gases, as well as soil pollution and so on and so forth. So, um, Open burning of waste, particularly that happens, I've this is a picture that I've taken actually, in open areas uh, releases also harmful uh, chemicals such as dioxins and furans because this is burning happening at low temperatures as well as uh, black carbon and other particulate matter into the, into the air. So there's, there's a whole gamut of um, ill effects and impacts of open dumping and open burning. And as I mentioned, these also release uh, open dumping uh, especially when there's organic waste in the in the dump sites, there is um, there's a release of greenhouse gas emissions. So, for instance, methane, and this exacerbates climate change. So, essentially, when you okay, moving to the next slide, please. Um, I want to quickly just talk a little bit about methane, uh, the focus of our discussion today. Um, some key facts about methane. So, it has um, a half life of approximately 9.1 years in the atmosphere. Uh, so when you look at, when you compare it to CO2, it's a you know, much shorter time frame, and therefore it has a you know, much larger effect uh, for a brief period of time. And um, estimates suggest that the global warming potential of methane is up to 28 times that of a carbon dioxide molecule for a 100 year time frame. But when you start looking at it in shorter time frames, like 20 years, for instance, um, the values are anywhere between 72 and 105, and uh, let's take an approximation of 84. And that basically tells you that, you know, uh, reducing methane emissions is extremely crucial for us to tackle climate change in any meaningful way. And um, so from the, from, the, from the point of the solid waste sector, next slide, please. 
from the point of view from the solid waste sector, you can see these two charts that are uh, coming from the Climate uh, Clean Air Coalition and UNEP's publication from 2022. It was essentially a global methane assessment 2030 baseline report. And um, it, it says that, okay, bearing in mind lots of uncertainties, they have a whole model that they essentially used. Um, it tells you that um, agricultural energy sectors are comparable in magnitude to each other and have roughly maybe twice the, almost twice the emissions of the waste sector, which in this case is including both the solid waste and the wastewater sectors. And uh, methane represents about 19% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, let's say livestock, as you can see the numbers, livestock is about 32%. And um, they say that 18% of all um, human derived uh, methane emissions come from the waste sector. Again, both the waste and water sector. Um, and as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, this, uh, the sector emissions from both the waste, uh, solid waste and the wastewater are projected to grow. Um, and they are intricately linked to population growth, economic development, and uh, but one thing to keep in mind is that the emissions from the solid waste sector are uh, said to be growing much more rapidly, both in tons per year as well as the percentage of emissions uh, than the within the wastewater sector. So this basically implies that you know um, addressing waste methane or methane from the waste sector. Um, gives us tangible opportunity. It has, um, and it also is imperative for us to tackle climate change. And a study by World Bank um, has suggested that by deploying uh, the best available technologies, methane emissions from the waste sector can be reduced by up to um, 80 percent. Um, moving to the uh, next slide, please. I want to quickly talk about our working group on landfills and um, ISWA's working group on landfill. Uh, basically focuses on the design, construction, regulation, management of landfills, uh, both in high income countries as well as low income countries. And when I talk about uh, operations and management, this includes closure, um, post closure issues of say, if you're closing a dump site or, a, or a, you know, an old landfill, uh, including groundwater monitoring, leachate treatment, uh, landfill gas management, um, the quantity and the quality of the waste that's being landfilled and so on. So. It's a working group that uh, that manages and discusses topics um, uh, for the whole gamut of uh, landfill uh, management, essentially. And uh, what I've put on the screen um, are all the all the publications over the years. Well, not all. This is not an exhaustive list, but quite a few of the publications that we've had uh, over the decades. And um, when I was doing my research uh, on this topic, I found out that our working group has been talking about dump site closure and landfill gas management and capture for decades actually since almost uh, 2006 was the first uh, report that I found uh, which is associated with open dumping um, and even then even back then uh, the initiative supported uh, moving away from open dumping to practices where waste is better contained and covered uh, and also you know reducing the environmental impacts of the the bad environmental impacts of waste disposal and dumping. So that's the paper on the left that you see. And um, I, I think on the on the attendees list, I saw some of the participants who were actually part of these studies way back in 2006. Um, so thank you for all your work. Um, the other papers that you see here, uh, you probably can't read the, the screen is too small, even I can't actually, but it's um, it's a key issue paper on the land on the role of landfills in the transition towards a towards resource management. Uh, there's something about landfill aftercare. There's the wasted health report, the tragic case of dump sites uh, from 2014, a roadmap for closing dump sites 2016, climate benefits to due to dump site closure 2018, and so on and so forth. The latest report that we um, worked on is the impact of management choices on landfill methane emissions uh, that was released at the ISFA World Congress in 2023 last October. So this is briefly about the work on um, that on landfills that we've been doing through our working group. And if you go to the next slide, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the task force on closing dump sites. So as you can see, the, the, the topic was being discussed at ISWA way before we launched, uh, formally launched this task force. Um, so this task force came into effect and was formally set up in 2018. It's 
currently an international partnership that's uh, led and facilitated by ISWA. We always look for uh, partners who are, you know, thinking along the same lines as us or who are interested in the same uh, dump site closure issues. And uh, we accomplish our work or the dump site, uh, the closing dump sites task force accomplishes its work through site visits, through technical assistance, scientific research, capacity building, and so on. Uh, so whichever municipality or jurisdiction that we're working with, uh, we try to help them with um, technical uh, knowledge as well as, you know, help them with their context specific issues. And so the goal, uh, the main aim and goal of this initiative is to enable jurisdictions, which are, you know, could be cities, could be national level uh, governments or even sub national uh, level governments with uh, support that's needed uh, for their uh, for the closure and, you know, closure of these dump sites and moving along the waste hierarchy in a coordinated and cohesive manner in order to mitigate essentially methane emissions and black carbon emissions that are coming from open dumping and burning. Um, and we propose best practice solutions uh, that work in one place to another to see if that can be, you know, uh, fitted into the into their context. And um, our goal is not only to play um, an active part in the closure of dump sites, but also to ensure that the final closure is going to be supported by um, good infrastructure, by um, integrated waste management or master plans. Um, also making sure that there is going to be institutional and administrative capacity uh, to carry that out and also financial resources and social support and which I'm going to talk a lot more about in the next slides, uh, social support for the people, you know, who are earning their livelihoods by working and living in uh, in and up around dump sites and um so therefore with this uh, with this initiative we are going to support municipalities and governments who are looking to make positive steps towards closing uh, dump sites in favor of more sustainable alternatives and um, across the whole as i said integrated sustainable waste management uh, hierarchy um and so uh, finally so closing these dump sites is not just about fixing waste problems. Uh, it's, it's a matter of protecting public health and the environment, as I mentioned, the ill effects of open dumping and open burning, and of course, improving the quality of lives by, you know, uh, helping move away from these unsustainable practices. Um, next slide, please. Um, so before we before we start talking about you know closure, landfill gas capture, and so on, um, we cannot uh, we cannot manage anything that we don't measure. And um, you must have been you must have already known, or if you're working in this in this field, that uh, uh, data related to waste management is very hard to come by, especially quality data. And so it's very essential to. Uh, do baseline studies uh, for the regions or municipalities or jurisdictions that you want to work in. And uh, in this regard, we've worked with two tools. Uh, one I haven't said anything about on the slide. It's the UN Habitats Waste Wise Cities tool, which is like a baseline data collection tool, which tells you um, about the waste flows within the region that you're working in. And then uh, further, we use uh, something called the Solid Waste Emissions Tool. Um, it, this is a tool that was developed by the US EPA under the GMI, under the Global Methane Initiative, supporting the Climate and Clean Air Coalition's work. And um, it's an Excel-based tool that quantifies uh, emissions of methane, black carbon, as well as other pollutants from the waste sources. And it essentially allows you to set up like a baseline scenario, uh, compare alternatives, also analyze uh, specific policies uh, or projects for those uh, potential emissions reductions. And um, it also helps you track progress over time if you, you know, if you put the right data in into the Excel sheet. Um, if you want to know more about this excellent tool, please visit the uh, website uh, and you can find it on the Clean Air Coalition's website. That's where I usually point people to, but I'm sure it's also on the GMI website. Um, so we've, uh, in the past, um, I was having a discussion with Tom last night and he was, uh, you know, thankfully, I remember that, yes, we have actually applied uh, SWEET to several um, sites in the past, uh, for instance, starting with the Estructural dump site in Brasilia, which was closed in 2018. Uh, we also applied it to the Rautenweg landfill in uh, Vienna, Austria, and the Hiria landfill in Tel Aviv, Israel, and the Rasaline uh, dump site in Tir, Lebanon, which uh, 
James is going to tell us a lot more in his presentation about. And um, we would we would like to apply it in the future to uh, Banyuwangi in East Java in Indonesia, as well as in Tabanan, which is uh, in Bali, uh, Indonesia, and Chengalpetu, Tamil Nadu, India. Uh, these three locations, because ISWA has been working for the past three years on uh, another project called Clean Oceans Through Clean Communities, and we've done baseline data collection and assessment already for all three sites. And so it's now a matter of um, actually putting it into the suite tool, redundant, um, to get uh, better data about emissions estimations and quantification about you know what the potential for emissions reductions are in these sites. Um, please uh, move to the next slide. Um, this is just a more like a fun slide. The reason I'm asking this question is because um, lots of people that we talk to in the global south, when we tell them that we have a task force on closing dump sites, um, and they look at us and they're like, but where do you want to go? Uh, okay, you'll close a dump site, but then what next? Because that's that's mostly what they know. Their default is uh, sending their waste to dump sites. And uh, so a more um, accurate description of what we're trying to do would be closing dump sites and moving up the waste hierarchy, or even more descriptive and accurate would be closing dump sites and moving uh, to an integrated sustainable waste management solution. But as you can see, it would be very cumbers uh, you know, cumbersome to put this on any kind of social media platform. So till we find a better alternative, it's going to be hashtag closing dump sites. Uh, but we are, if, if anybody has uh, better ideas, please do write to us. Uh, to James or me, and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to take your suggestions. Next slide, please. Um, now, I just want to uh, talk about briefly uh, about the considerations that we need to take when we want to close a dump site. And uh, it's a complex process, but essentially, in principle, there are three available methods. Uh, you, can, you can close a dump site by covering the waste, so it's in place. Uh, you just put a cover and, I mean, of course, a lot more than that. Second would be to um, closing by removing that waste from the site and, you know, mining it, uh, remediating it, evacuating it, putting it somewhere else. Uh, a lot of this is being done in India currently. And third, you would, you know, uh, do it by upgrading the dump to a more controlled uh, site or a, perhaps like a sanitary landfill. So these are the three, in essence, in, you know, the three ways that in, in which you can close a dump site. And the option that you choose is obviously going to be based on the study of the site itself and taking into consideration uh, sustainability as well as affordability because it's not a cheap affair at all. Uh, and looking at the local context um, while also remaining um, cognizant of the fact that, you know, the real improvement is going to be in relation to the environmental impacts of that dump site, you know, whether it's actually going to be improving or not by closing that dump site. Um, and um, that sometimes out of those three methods, uh, one should be also careful and keep in mind that uh, not the, so usually it's not, or sometimes it can be that the most technically an advanced solution might not be the best option for that particular site, okay? So uh, uh, obviously a feasibility study, a very detailed technical analysis has to go into place um, and so on. Um, so the key principle should be keep it simple. Uh, it should be sustainable in the local context and um, you're trying to maximize um, environmental performance or minimize in environmental impact. And um, as, as we saw the ill effects of open dumping and burning, there are obviously, or of course, several benefits of closing uh, dump sites and upgrading to more sustainable sound waste management systems. So uh, when you look at the environmental benefits, you can of course have reduced methane emissions or greenhouse gas, em uh, gas emissions reductions. Um, open dumps usually tend to catch fire. So of course, black carbon is reduced, reduced pollution of air, land, fresh water, so on and so forth. Um, of course, uh, when you're closing the site, you're hopefully moving up the waste hierarchy. So you're reducing, of course, our reliance on raw materials. Um, there's also the effect on public health and the quality of life, again, through air pollution and so on. Your neighborhood is cleaner. You don't have an open dump that you're looking at every day, so on and so forth. So the benefits uh, are plenty, but one has to be aware and cognizant uh, of the fact that closure, uh, closing a dump site or a closure of the dump site is a very complex process. Uh, which needs to be properly planned, including, you know, thinking about technical aspects, environmental aspects, economic aspects, as well as social considerations. 
And uh, before you can actually close a dump site, you need to have an alternative waste management system in place. Otherwise, you're going to be uh, producing or another dump site is going to pop up eventually in another, in another place. Uh, so you also need to have adequate institutional capacity and last but never the least political consensus. If there's no political will, it's never going to happen. And so when we talk about technical considerations, um, I'm not going to list the whole thing, but one has to always look at the, of course, the short term solutions, but also the long term management of that of that closed site, um, whether it's looking at uh, if there's going to be leachate coming out of it after you close it. Yeah, are there going to be gases released? Are you going to capture those gases? Um, how are you going to maintain um, storm water and uh, rainwater during the closing process as well as after the closing has happened? Uh, what are your sealing systems going to look like, so on and so forth, the long term rehabilitation maintenance of the site itself. Financial considerations also have to be taken into account uh, because, as I said, it's not a cheap process. It's quite complex and uh, especially if there are hazardous materials that are present in the site already, which is the case of uh, several sites here in India, especially the mega sites, because those were the primary way of waste disposal. And so they have sometimes mercury, sometimes uh, other hazardous materials. And so the, uh, the, the funding for that, you know, for remediating closing uh, needs to be taken into account and sometimes needs uh, quite a large amount of uh, sum of money, uh, which could be in terms of like grants or loans and so on and so forth. Um, the social aspects I want to delve a little bit upon because uh, what tends to happen is that with growing concerns about these uh, dump sites being in and around living spaces around uh, towns and cities, the pressure to close these sites are uh, is uh, are increasing, and uh, these processes usually happen extremely quickly and hastily, and sometimes without the consideration for, uh, as I had mentioned before, the you know the livelihoods of waste pickers and uh, people living around those sites. Um, so I want to just mention briefly. Uh, you remember I mentioned the Estructural dump site in Brasilia. I'm always never saying it right. Uh, but they closed that site in 2018 and experiences from Brasilia and other parts of the world uh, are showing us that inclusion of people living around the sites who are depending with on uh, uh, for their livelihood on those sites uh, are extremely crucial to plan for and should be part of the whole management and closure plan. Um, and the dump site in Brasilia was closed in 2018, as I mentioned. Um, it was operational since 19... 60 and um, there were several notices sent across uh, along the decades like you know there, there was a major environmental concern because it was next to a river um, very close uh, proximity to a river which was a water source for brasilia as well and about 40,000 uh, household or waste pickers were living around that site and uh, despite many closure orders uh, in 2015 the new uh, mayor who came in the governor of Brasilia, he basically said that, let me take the step and close um, the site. And what they did was they basically had a comprehensive plan. Uh, they identified several issues uh, that needed to be addressed and almost about 17, 18 government agencies were involved in this, in this plan. And they also included like an epidemiological study uh, to um, look at the waste picker community and essentially integrate them into the process. Uh, for helping them basically transition from working at that site to working in more controlled facilities, recycling facilities, and so on. Um, so there's, uh, there's an organization called Viego. Um, they were also involved in this uh, study as well as the whole uh, monitoring evaluation of this, uh, of this closure of the site. Um, participatory platforms were set up as well for people to um, give inputs and um, they were given more, you know, they were given educational opportunities and um, they were also given health benefits. So, you know, essentially, because when they were working there, they didn't have any PPPs, but when the transition happened, um, they were, of course, given better, better equipment and so on. Of course, uh, not to say that there were not any hiccups. Uh, they were, there were challenges in the beginning, but eventually it was a success story and the process demonstrated how governments can address these concerns uh, or environmental concerns as well as social concerns uh, which include livelihood protection uh, when when they do such closures so several lessons uh, have been learned and hopefully this is going to you know be sim similar cases can be applied to different parts of the world that are looking to close their dump sites 
and I had the good opportunity, James as well was there to hear about this story firsthand from a third generation waste picker um, at COP28. She was at our panel and she told us about exactly the steps that were followed and how it was a success. Um, next slide, please. So um, all goes to show that, of course, uh, closure can be one step. Uh, so once that is uh, once that process is in place, uh, management of landfill gas is going to be a key issue uh, during the operations of of any dump or closing of a dump site or a landfill. Um, so whether it's an engineered landfill or an open dump, because it if there's any organic material that reaches the site, it is going to be generating methane in anaerobic conditions. Um, and if you talk about landfill gas, it's approximately uh, 50 to 60 percent methane, and then you have CO2 and other trace gases and um, other compounds in trace quantities. But again, six, 50 to 60 percent methane. So that's one important thing to remember. Um, I won't talk too much in detail about this whole process. There will be, of course, other webinars, and James will also mention briefly. But the points that I have on the slide, I just want to briefly say that. Um, in 2019, IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they um, refined their guidelines to include higher fraction of degradable organic carbon for is easily degradable carbon and lower for um, degradable organic carbon for less degradable carbon. And what that means essentially is uh, that uh, a large part of methane reduction potential can be expected uh, right at the beginning when the waste reaches the site. So, um, IPCC made this amendment because they um, found strong indications that methane generation is higher than they previously thought uh, shortly after uh, landfilling, so after the waste reaches the site, and uh, lower than previously that they had assumed in later years. So all goes to show that, you know, if those capping systems and those uh, landfill gas treatment capture systems are not in place, it's it's difficult to, you know, get good quality gas out of it. So um, landfill gas can be controlled using, you know, several techniques that can include containment, um, extraction, as I mentioned, uh, which you can see on the screen through vertical gas extraction wells or even horizontal extraction wells. Um, you need to make sure that the leachate levels are low. Uh, so maintenance of those leachate levels and then, of course, uh, providing a bio cover. That's something that our working group is working on currently. Um, you know, to provide like an oxidation zone uh, above the cap and so on. So um, that all sounds great, except that um, this capture and utilization is technically and financially challenging for uh, many communities. Uh, so it basically leads to sometimes uh, inadequate or failed ga landfill gas projects. So um, if there are uh, policies in place um, that encourage methane capture by incentivizing, say, landfill gas utilization or maybe favoring it as a fuel, transportation fuel or cooking fuel or whatever. If, if uh, there are policies in place to offer tax benefits uh, for these kind of technologies, uh, thereby, you know, making it a va valuable energy source, then people can actually uh, make those projects a success. Uh, but for uh, these kind of projects to be a success, control measures have to be effective and maintenance is, is key, which, which is again expensive. So uh, it's not always that municipalities can actually afford these uh, landfill gas capture and use um, projects, especially in low and middle income countries. I know that in the US there are several uh, hundreds, if not thousands of successful cases taking place and uh, the US EPA you know, analyzes which other sites could be a potential for such a project. But I'm talking about low and middle income uh, countries, what should they be doing then? Uh, that takes me to the next slide. And here, um, here I want to talk about organic waste management strategies uh, because what's the next best thing, right? You're hoping to uh, not have any organic waste reach the landfill or the dump site in the first place because that's the organic waste in the landfill is what's generating the methane. And so to have a comprehensive organic waste uh, management strategy to prevent such waste from reaching landfills or dump sites. Uh, several key steps need to take place. Uh, first and foremost, um, if you hear from the chair of our working group on biological treatment of waste and our vice chair as well, uh, we're always advocating for source separation. 
uh, we need to encourage households and businesses to separate organic waste from other waste streams and at source, it's the cheapest way to do it. Uh, then of course, having a proper collection and transportation, having a dedicated system j just for organics, uh, ensuring that it's transported to appropriate facilities, whether it's composting plants or if it's AD um, and whether at community level, whatever. Um, and another, way, another cheap way or effective way would be to promote composting as a primary method for organic waste treatment. Uh, it can be done at a household level. It can be done at a, comp a community level. It can be also be done at like a municipality level through large scale composting facilities. But always try at the, if, if feasible to treat the waste as close to source uh, as possible. And so this is just a rule of thumb, but all, all levels of treatment are possible here. Um, then we come to AD, which is biogas plants, uh, you know, utilize AD to convert that organic waste into biogas, which can be used as a renewable energy source. As I said, if you, if you purify that biogas further, you can get transportation fuel as well. Lots of uh, cities and municipalities in India are doing that as well. And then you also get digestate, which can be used as a soil enhancer. And for all these things to be uh, effective and to work properly, you need to have proper policies and legislations in place. Um, and last but not the least, there needs to be a market for these products from these processes. So whether it's for compost or whether it's from, for digestate or whether it's for the biogas uh, to ensure economic viability and sustainability that needs to be thought about before setting up these uh, systems. And uh, for these strategies, of course, there needs to be a good system in place between government and industry and obviously the public as well. Uh, essentially, we are the data points that need to need to work on source separation, right? Like it starts at home. Um, I want to go into my final slide. Uh, I think I'm already over time. I'm sorry. Um, so just final conclusions, final remarks. Uh, what I've mentioned uh, so far is that methane from the waste sector is intricately tied to the development, uh, to development. So it's GDP as well as population growth, and that's set to rise in the coming decades. So without any kind of uh, collective concerted action, emissions from the sector are going to rise and um, which is not going to bode well for climate change and so on and so forth. Uh, so mitigating uh, methane emissions from our sector, which is a solid waste sector, provides uh, opportunities for action and addressing climate change. And uh, finally, as I mentioned in the organic uh, strategy, we need to have waste segregation. Uh, we need to implement strategies for organic, you know, for organic waste management, uh, as well as when feasible and possible and you know, financially viable, landfill management with uh, gas capture or dump site closures. Um, my final slide is just, um, uh, if you go next, is going to be just a list of not exhaustive at all, but like some uh, key uh, websites where you can get a lot of information and good resources uh, for if, if you're working in the field, uh, the, the, these are some good starting points, but there are lots of uh, organizations now uh, working on these, uh, you know, wa uh, waste management and methane from the waste sector issues. And I hand it back to Matt. Uh, thank you so much. Matt, back to you. Thank you. That was that was quite a good tour through, uh, you know, a lot of what ISWA has been doing and some, some useful information about, um, you know, the problem that we're facing and some of the solutions. So thank you so much. That was a great talk. I think um, we'll carry on with James's presentation now, and then we'll, I see some good questions coming up in the chat in the q a so that's great we'll we'll get some answers uh later on in the session and so so let's move forward if we could load uh james's presentation so james law is vice president at scs engineers he has over 35 years of experience in civil geotechnical engineering and solid waste management industry on both nationally and international uh, projects his experience in solid waste facility design and management include Landfill bottom liner and leachate collection systems, landfill final cover system, landfill gas collection system, uh, and equipment and procurement for overseas, uh, solid waste transfer facilities, aerobic bioreactor landfill remediation, and leachate recirculation evaluations in obtaining uh, RD and D permits. He is a, an honorary member of the International Solid Waste Association 
chair of the ISWA Working Group on Landfills and the Task Force on Closing Dump Sites uh, Global Initiative. Mr. Law is also a member of the Solid Waste Association of North America, which is a, a national member of ISWA. He's currently licensed as a professional engineer in multiple states in the United States of America. He's also certified as a board certified environmental engineer in sustainability by the American Association of Environmental Engineers and Scientists, and also accredited as a lead uh, AP, B, D, and C by the United States Green Building Council. Uh, so James, uh, over to you. Thank you, Matt, for your introduction. And thank you, Edidi, for did an excellent job in introducing ISWA and what we do at ISWA. And uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, you guys uh, organizing this particular event. I think it's a very uh, important topic to talk about these days, especially with everybody's focusing on the climate change and uh, what uh, uh, dump sites and methane uh, will uh, inter interrelated to the uh, to the uh, uh, methane emissions as well as uh, uh, what we are doing uh, on the day day to day basis. So uh, let me uh, uh, proceed on. Uh, I think I did cover a wide range of topic, introducing the topic here, and I will just uh, give you a quick outline here to to kind of uh, uh, show you what uh, we will be discussing in the next uh, uh, half an hour or so. Uh, so I some of the topic I will not touch uh, a lot, but I will focus on the uh, long term solutions, specifically on the uh, final cover systems, and uh, hopefully we will then uh, lead into a discussion uh, on the uh, uh, case study that we did in Lebanon. So, so, um, so why closing dump site is a global priority, and uh, just look at the uh, some of the published data. Uh, uh, to my right, uh, the, the pie chart that basically indicating that uh, about 70% of the global waste that goes to dumps, either dump site or control or sanitary landfills. So basically, you know, uh, your two thirds of the waste go to the sort of uh, dump site landfill environment. And uh, depending on what you are uh, looking at, uh, uh, the World Bank published at 33% and uh, ISWA, we uh, a little bit higher, which is 40%. Basically, basically say that 40% of the uh, waste that actually go to the open dump situation, 40% of the 70% uh, on the previous statement. And, uh, and then they are mostly coming from 90% of the uh, low income countries. Uh, this day we refer to the global south. So, you know, it's a significant numbers and there is um, uh, as Edith said, uh, ISWA is an international uh, organization, and there, there are a lot of work that we need to do here uh, in order to, to uh, you know, to uh, make make a significant uh, influence or impact to to the uh, climate change uh, uh, arena. And uh, this is a map atlas that uh, ISWA published back in 2014-15 windows. We identified uh, 50 largest and dangerous uh, dump sites around the world. And bear in mind, 50 is not a real number. Okay, 50, 50 is a number that was the uh, dump site that respond to our survey request. And uh, they, I'm pretty sure that the real number is, you know, probably 10 times more than that. But um, in terms of dump site statistics. Uh, Globally, we have over 50,000 uh, dump sites, and there are, you know, over 2 million people working on the dump site, whether it's a waste picker or workers, but, you know, it's a big number uh, if, we, if you look at it uh, as a whole picture here. And then um, in red, I point out that uh, in 2016, just first part of 2016, there are about 750 people killed at the dump site, whether the dump site is collapse or uh, slow failures or due to fires or anything anything related to uh, 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 that man manner. So dump site is a very um, dangerous environment to be in because by itself, because waste is piled up uh, uncontrolled manners. Uh, so it's uh, in a in a engineering term we call it unstable. So uh, so it is a dangerous uh, uh, structure that human 
uh, created. So we need to kind of uh, really try to take care of that. And uh, now, as you see, I try to circle some of the site name. There are, at least to date, I, I believe there are less than 10% of the dump site that we identified that is actually closed. And, uh, uh, but, uh, so, you know, this, this can lead to, can we call this as a global emergency? Uh, internal health or climate change that we actually needed to push people to do something about it. So that's a question I'd like to post to you guys. Um, and uh, um, okay, so uh, COP28 that happened just a few weeks ago in Dubai, and uh, at our pavilions, this is the first time Israel uh, uh, hosted a, a waste and resources uh, pavilion because. Uh, we were there a few, few years ago, and there is no nobody talk about waste. But and yet, uh, a lot of li literature out there saying that hey, you know, uh, Damsai is the third largest greenhouse gas generator. Uh, so how come nobody do anything about it, right? So I think this year we took a more proactive uh, actions, and then we were able to um, to find enough sponsor to to uh, support us to to have this. Uh, to, to have our voice uh, being uh, heard at the uh, at the COP28. And um, now, uh, given that it is a dump site situation, and we dump site does generate a lot of methane gas, it is a low hanging fruit that we can address. And then we can, then, you know, uh, if we close the dump site, that is a, that certainly can come up with the numbers by going through the modeling process to say, hey, you know, how much, uh, methane emission reduction that that uh, that will result and then uh, you know in the case study later on I, I will show you, uh, show you that what what we did uh, in a couple of years ago and the other issue I mentioned earlier that uh, slope instability is a is a big big issue and uh, especially now that we are also talking about going in and doing some bio mining and this sort of thing so we we didn't we really need to look at this thing very closely so that in order in order to avoid unnecessary uh, health issue and loss of life. Uh, these are the pictures that kind of example of uh, when uh, when the slope fails, it can really uh, become a huge problem. Uh, the 2000 uh, landfill, uh, Payata landfill in, uh, in Philippines, when it failed, it killed a few hundred people. Uh, it, just imagine the picture tells you people live very close to dump sites, so so there's no no way to escape, right? And then fires at at the landfill is a dump site is very common. Uh, so if we do nothing, scenario, uh, what 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 is the implication here? If you look at the picture here, dump, uh, the dump site is very very close to like uh, the top pictures there is it, uh, that those are people living in the the apartment complex and you know it's very basically you know uh, several meter hundred meters away uh, it's very close and uh, it, it, and uh, so it is a concern uh, regarding to uh, global health and environmental uh, issue especially for people living around or on the dump sites and uh, uh, last month i was in uh, nigeria they have about 1500 waste picker on a dump site so it is an issue that we need to uh, address. Um, now, other issue regarding air and plastic pollution, as you can see the lower pictures there, you know, there's a lot of plastic at the dump sites. Uh, just like we have here too, even sanitary land here, we have a lot of plastic. And uh, especially uh, if you are near a river or uh, waterways, marine litter will become a, a problem. Uh, so, so what is, um, if you, I don't know what is what go through your mind, but when I look at this picture, and actually I was I was the one who took the pictures, and I can make a statement say hey, waste is about people, you know, and uh, there are some uh, basic human rights that is being violated. Uh, just like we are all entitled for air, waters, and uh, food, and but then why nobody look at waste issue closely and do something about it. And uh, I certainly encourage people who are in the decision maker uh, uh, governmental uh, level, high level official that you really need to uh, 
tackle this problem. Uh, and I think uh, uh, without actions uh, uh, with the dump sites, the uh, greenhouse gas emission, I think by next year is about eight to 10 percent uh, emissions. And uh, by 2050, I'm pretty sure that number will be much higher. Um, so uh, <clears throat> just want to point that out. And uh, okay, I did already talk about our publication, and there, these are this uh, these are the uh, publication that is very useful tool uh, for people who wanted to uh, consider uh, to realize what kind of climate benefits that we're going to have, as well as uh, 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 the roadmap. Basically, have an uh, entire section uh, chapter in there talk about technical challenges and solutions. Uh, which I will be talking about here on, in this presentation, but um, yeah, I will skip over to the the, the, the book. Also, talk about fi financial, socials, and uh, and uh, other other aspects that uh, you could probably go to the uh, uh, Israel downside to download it. Uh, in uh, 2019, we also revised a uh, uh, guidelines, which we call it at the landfill operational uh, guidelines. It's a third edition, and that that one give you a pretty good account of uh, how to properly operate uh, landfills, and uh, and you know uh, it's pretty comprehensive uh, uh, documents that I also encourage you to to get hold of that copy, and then uh, you, you can get a pretty good uh, 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 view of uh, what need to be done. And uh, last. Uh, I guess a year and a half ago, uh, Iswa also released a book called um, "The Waste Crisis." Uh, this one's this one specifically try to provide a roadmap for sustainable waste management uh, in developing countries. So it's, uh, it could be an interesting reading for uh, some of you, some of you guys. Um, so uh, so I won't go through all this because I think. These are the key phases uh, for a successful project, say, uh, closing dump sites. And as you can see, a lot of items that Aditi already touched on, and uh, I will probably focus on one or two items. Uh, a particular, um, there are a few points that I'd like to point out is that, uh, uh, given that it is a dump site operation, it's very difficult to, uh, to obtain uh, reliable, accurate waste data, such as how many tons is or the uh, place in the ground because to do uh, to do gas modeling uh, you you need those data and uh, so so a lot of time you had to do uh, 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 to do a, like interview of the uh, people that work at the landfills and hopefully you'll find someone who know the history of the landfills then you can try to come up with some data that makes sense to you um, the uh, the other thing about waste dump site is this, uh, as, you, as some of the picture I showed earlier that the common thing of the dump site is very tall, very steep. And uh, it, is, uh, it is very difficult to close a dump site because of those features. And so uh, uh, you, you must have a, some kind of a comprehensive uh, uh, waste management plan in place already is how, how are you going to close a dump site like few, many years before that so that at least you can try to shape even though you don't do compassion on the waste uh, 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 as such but at least you give you an opportunity and do less work when your time when the time comes to close a dump site so and, and I will try to flatten the slope as much as you can and then, and then you know try not to uh, 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 get into a situation that the uh, the slope is not stable, so they cannot really put equipment on top. Um, now, uh, this this is a list of uh, technical problems and challenges that I thought is relevant for uh, dump sites situations. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, dump site usually, you know, you just dump the Dump the waste, and then you you may have a dozer that push it out to the level it off, and there's no control of uh, compassion, apply compassion, etc. And uh, there's no daily cover usually. I mean, you go to the dump site, you look, you can see hundreds of meters of waste completely exposed. And then guess what? You know, when you have rain come down, all those rain penetrate, infiltrate through the waste. 
So become a leachate down the bottom and go somewhere else because dump site usually does not have a bottom line of systems. And the other features that is common in dump site is uh, uh, fires and and there's no stopping it. Whether it is uh, uh, it's a is it is uh, internal combustion or uh, whether it is due to the uh, waste uh, pickers try to get some copper out of the wire. They will set on fire try to try to get them. Metals and in the process, you know, they could easily set on fires uh, at the landfills. Um, and dump site usually had no control over what kind of waste they're receiving, and there's no record of it. So it could be anything. So if you're going to do some kind of a uh, landfill mining project, etc., uh, so and you you may run into a certain thing that you need to deal with. So this is as a Something to keep the better in mind when you do planning. Uh, you need to be able to uh, able to handle that, and then uh, when the situation arrives, and uh, you need to deal with it. Um, I think one of the biggest problem with dump sites is that there's no security defense. Therefore, you encourage uh, uh, scavenging at the site. Uh, uh, waste picker is probably not easy to control, and uh, um, so it is a big uh, social issues there and uh, um, I wouldn't say much here, but uh, maybe uh, other speaker for the series can touch on the social aspect of it. Um, the uh, leachate treatments, obviously there's none in place and so so is uh, the uh, odor control or landfill gas management, uh, there's probably none. And uh, I think uh, the only opportunity you may have is try to put in some kind of gas uh, collection system after closure, which we'll be touching a little bit on that. And then, uh, and, and then uh, hopefully we'll address, stir some interest and then uh, uh, other speakers in the, the, the remaining series can actually dive deeper into it. Uh, dump site being a dump site, uh, there is no uh, engineering measure or planning in place. Uh, usually, we refer to a uh, bottom liner system or leachate collection system at the bottom. Uh, but uh, uh, there are some opportunity to do that if you expand the uh, the uh, dump site next to it, and which we will talk about a little bit about on that. Uh, <clears throat> now, these are the list of uh, site enhancement uh, strategy that I can think of, and uh, the, I think the very first one is. Uh, if you're operating a dump site right now, you can you can certainly implement immediate site improvement because if you try to improve your site condition, it is always less work to do when you when it's time to close that particular dump site. And uh, as you can on the third line down, uh, I I mentioned about the if you have a gas collection system, you can pretty much catch your sixty to ninety percent of the methane. And uh, bio covers probably around uh, eighty percent, and then uh, the other method is uh, strategy is uh, waste diversion and composting. Another way that try to divert the organic matter out of the uh, dump site, and that definitely will re reduce uh, methane emission at the dump site. Uh, landfill mining is another strategy there, uh, which involve reducing uh, waste volumes. Uh, and uh, potentially recover some resources, but uh, 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 for future methane emission, <clears throat> you, you can certainly eliminate uh, that part of it. And uh, probably probably one of the most important reasons why people do landfill mining is to re uh, reclaim land, especially if you are in a, in the a high real estate values uh, areas and. Um, uh, that may that may be one of the reasons why people do that. Now, in terms of uh, some other innovative uh, technologies such as uh, gasifications and uh, use of drones for uh, landfill monitoring, and this this uh, this technology definitely offer new ways to reduce uh, or utilize uh, methane gas emissions. Um, now, I will be talking about long term solution. Um, Collect, uh, to collect the uh, methane gas using effective uh, final cover system and uh, 
combined with the gas collection system. Uh, yeah, uh, let me see what's the next slide. Okay. Um, at the dump site situation, uh, you, you could put in active or passive gas collection system because the whole idea here is uh, try to try to re reduce the uh, uh, methane uh, uh, emission to the atmosphere and collectively, if you have a system that can collect gas and try to flare it off, is uh, is better than uh, releasing methane in the atmosphere, which is 20 plus times uh, uh, more prudent than, uh, than uh, carbon dioxide. So um, now if you have a collection system in place, it, uh, it can also control uh, potential subsurface landfill gas uh, migration uh, underground. And uh, it would also control the uh, pressure that is built up within, within the uh, waste mass itself. And of course, you know, uh, one of the beneficial uh, utilization of the methane gas is, uh, you know, to uh, hopefully you can pipe the uh, gas to a uh, gas to energy uh, plant. Um, it's all depend on how much gas uh, when you consider different options. So, uh, in terms of long term solutions, there are three uh, methods uh, of closing open dump sites. And uh, the first one is uh, something to do with closure by upgrading. In other words, you are upgrading the dump site into controlled sanitary landfill uh, environment. And the second one is uh, in place closure. It's basically, uh, you basically put in the final cover system on top of that. And the third thing is uh, completely removing waste from the dump. And this, this part, some, you know, the other terminology is landfill mining or bio mining, whatever you call it. So these are the three uh, long term solutions. And uh, let me uh, get to the first one closure by upgrading. As you can, I, I'm not going to read everything from here, but uh, at least I'll give you, you guys are probably going to get a copy of this so uh, you could uh, you know, read in details if you wish. But basically, is the existing dump sites, you put a low permeable cap over it, and then you uh, put vegetation over it. And then you would install some, some kind of basic uh, gas collection system. And it could, it could be passive or active system, and uh, depending on what you want to do with the gas. And uh, uh, obviously, you know, if it is active system, you can actually uh, uh, reduce the uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, if you just passively collect, it's just discharging the atmosphere. So that doesn't that doesn't do you any good other than control fires and uh, all these other other issue I'm talking about earlier. Um, now, um, when you upgrade a dump site, obviously you will have an opportunity to control stormwaters and also regrading the surface so that leachate generation is kept to the minimum. Uh, now, let's say you. Adjacent to the dump site, you have a piece of land that uh, is available, and this is where you can try to design a control uh, sanitary landfill, which means you put in the liner systems, leachate collection systems, and then the new waste will go there while you try to do something with the, the old uh, dump sites. Uh, so uh, one key com uh, uh, consideration is uh, you, you uh, it is useful to think in terms of try to do things in a simple manner and sustainable manner and try to use local construction uh, methods and uh, materials because then you are minimizing costs, but then you're maximizing the, uh, the uh, environmental improvement and performance. And uh, it's probably easy for the local uh, people to adapt to it. Um, and um, now, in place closure, which is probably the most common uh, common one that uh, when we talk about solutions, so you basically install a, a permanent final cover system over it, and then you you also would install a gas collection system, and uh, whether it's passive or uh, active, uh, it's really depending on uh, how much gas is remaining. Gas generation volume is in the uh, waste uh, mass. Uh, and also how old that waste is, because you know some some uh, dump site is very old and there is very limited amount of methane gas coming out of there. 
So you, you probably don't want it to put a super active uh, gas collection system, uh, try to collect a small amount of gas, uh, uh, then you, know, you don't really get uh, uh, most out of it. And um, now, when you put a, when you install a final cover system, obviously these are the four, five items that I listed there that you will realize uh, the benefit right away, which is you basically reduce a uh, waste exposure, uh, wind blown uh, offsite, and then uh, you, you can minimize the risk of fires, uh, prevent people or animals from scavenging uh, the waste. And you have better control of uh, surface water and therefore reducing the leachate generation. Uh, if, and uh, by putting a cover system over the, the entire site, uh, you have better control of odors and gas migrations. Uh, this is assuming that you have a, some kind of gas collection system that uh, apply a vacuum to it. And uh, now um, end use of closed site, uh, there, are, there are plenty of examples out there, but uh, common common uh, passive use and use is uh, usually converted into a park or a, a ball fields of, of, of the nature. Uh, now, re removal of waste uh, methods. I think this is probably the, the part of the list on my list to do here because it is very involved. Uh, if you try to decide to to see through the ways and uh, try to uh, 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 basically try to segregate the, the, the waste in the different materials. And then now the question we had to ask is where are this material gonna go? Is there any takers? If there's no takers, that means you have gotta stop house somewhere else uh, uh, instead of that in one location, right? So something something that need to be think, that we need to think about when we do this sort of uh, planning and then Unless it's mass dense, uh, the real estate uh, value is so high that all the costs you put in to remove the waste and uh, the uh, and disposal of it is far far more than uh, you know uh, far far more than the cost of doing the work. So you can put in uh, high rise or condos, you know, and they get a whole lot out of it. At the same time, you can clean up the site, so it's a it's a happy ending there. Uh, so. Um, I don't think I need to go through this in details because uh, uh, it is a pretty uh, comprehensive uh, planning that you need. And then the safety uh, of uh, of doing uh, landfill mining uh, is very important. And uh, and uh, you know because many things when it's in the right mix uh, between five and fifteen percent, you could have uh, explode. Uh, it, it, it could explode. So uh, it's, you got to be very careful with that. Uh, now, now, let me, uh, remaining time, I want to talk about the, uh, the project that we did in Lebanon, uh, and, um, the, uh, this, this is a, this is, uh, the first, uh, project that we, uh, partner with, uh, CCAC, uh, to, uh, come up with, uh, better, uh, uh, gas emission, uh, esti estimation using, uh, a sweet tool that Didi mentioned earlier, and this is what it, probably the first time that we applied this uh, tool on on the project. And um, the duration of this uh, uh, this project is kind of long because uh, bear in mind we have COVID happening in between, so none of us can travel to Lebanon. So, uh, so a lot of a lot of work is done online, and we're fortunate in, fortunate enough that we have we know enough ground people, ground champion that can go out and collect data for us and uh, make this uh, study uh, possible. And we also do a three days training workshops uh, back in June, 2021. And then we, our final uh, report uh, and the videos uh, was completed in November, uh, 2021, followed by a, a webinar to present the final reports and, uh, and, and uh, that's like a, a Pretty uh, comprehensive uh, 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 products that we get out of this project. And uh, one one thing I want to mention here is this particular project that because we do have reliable site specific data that we collect on uh, uh, waste volumes, as well as also they have a uh, 
detailed integrated waste management uh, system plan in place. And so we know what they want to do and therefore make the scenario that uh, I'm going to present to you uh, in a few slides later that makes sense because one of the thing is that how, how much waste you want to divert, right? So, so it's all uh, discussed in the uh, in the integrated uh, management plan. So, which is a, which is a good thing to have. And I'm, I, I uh, want to apologize. Uh, this is a very nice video, but it cannot be played here on this platform, unfortunately. But we will try to send you a link on. Uh, how to get it from the ISWA website. And uh, so hopefully you're enjoying the, the, the video we created. And, and okay, so basically there are five scenarios that we look at in terms of our gas emission estimation for this uh, Lebanon project. The first, first uh, BAU basically, basically said business as usual, do nothing, okay? And then, and then this scenario is compared to the next four uh, alternative. The first one, S1 is, okay, we'll remediate the, west, uh, the, the landfill, the dump site. And uh, notice that years that, because the study was done in 2020, 2022, uh, when you remediate, we're assuming that the dump site will remediate in the three years window. Uh, it will be capped by 2025. And so some of the number and chart that come out later on, it, uh, it's just bear in mind about this years, you know. And then second is uh, we, will, we will remediate the dump site and then we will also uh, develop a new uh, landfill uh, and then the new landfill will be ready uh, around uh, 2023. And the third option is do all the above but we're going to implement a phase one diversion of waste uh, up to 40%. And this will, uh, this will um, uh, be done ar uh, around 2025. And the last option is basically the S3, but uh, we say, okay, instead of 40% diversion, we're going to bring it up to 52% and, and then see what happens. So uh, this is a uh, this is a result uh, of the uh, modeling using suite. As you can see, the uh, BAU, which is do nothing scenario, is uh, is the or uh, orange line on the very top line, and then every 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 other lines with different colors below it is uh, one of the four uh, alternative. And the bottom line is the brown line, which is the uh, S three, which is uh, basically say divert. Diversion, waste diversion is forty uh, percent, and that come out to be the best uh, uh, best uh, alternative. And uh, in tables compared to the baseline scenario, and uh, it is uh, uh, 2025, As you can see, right right after uh, remediate the site, you can. You can have thirty percent uh, reduction right away in in uh, uh, just by doing uh, uh, that, and then uh, twenty fifty the overall is sixty one percent reduction for uh, scenario uh, S three, which is diversion uh, waste forty percent of that waste, and so as you keep, as you can see some of this number are pretty significant so uh, if you if you chose to do something and not do nothing uh, so uh, our conclusion is that the large uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction is uh, achievable and uh, it will definitely have a significant impact in terms of climate change by doing uh, you know closing dump site build a new sanitary landfill and diverse 40% of the waste uh, for composting and recycling uh, and uh, I believe this report is on our website also that can be downloaded. And I won't go through this particular slide because I did already touch on that. And uh, we were at COP, and then uh, this uh, the mayor did show up, and then we have a uh, Carlos, our president, <laughs> pulled me aside to take a picture with him. So, uh, conclusion: uh, closing of dump sites uh, re it, it, it is require alternative. Waste management system. Uh, you, we cannot just go and tell people say, "Hey, close your dump site," but you don't really provide where the where the new waste is going to go, right? 
So either either you start doing sanitary landfill or you can consider other uh, uh, ways management uh, systems such as uh, you know sorting as source and then and then send different kind of material to different places and uh, uh, in such a way that you know will make sense for the local economies and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we always. Uh, Try to say to people that you know, you can certainly consider the most advanced uh, solutions, but then uh, it it may not it may not work for you. Or it may not be the right answer for you. And uh, sometimes the simple and sustainable uh, solution is probably the, uh, is a better one. And uh, but then you had to consider all your site specific condition and your and you know and your political and. Uh, 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 social environment uh, changing something is very difficult, uh, but anyway, uh, it's all about our mindset, right? And uh, and uh, I think uh, with that, I think Mark, uh, Matt, I think I've, I've this is my final slides already. Great, thanks very much, James. That okay. was great, uh, and I appreciate uh, everybody um, hanging in with us as we we uh, went through the presentations and. There are some questions, James and Aditi, uh, you know, that we've received, and I, I thought maybe we, we have a few more minutes here. We could try to address some of them. Um, mm -hmm. one, one of the questions, or I guess themes of some of the questions is around uh, modeling using suite tool versus like measuring actual, you know, uh, releases and these kinds of things. And where where are you, James or and or Aditi on the kind of when it when measurement is 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 needed or or better than simply kind of using models for for whatever phase of the process, whether it's design or you know monitoring or whatever. So, do you have some thoughts? Okay, uh, okay, I can start, and then Aditi can add. Uh, you know, with uh, I guess with the technology that we have these days, I think drone is a good tool for at least you know. Uh, for um, for us to use, try to figure out how much waste is in 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 the uh, in the dump site. I mean, I'm gonna talk specifically about dump site now because uh, first of all, they don't have scale house. They cannot wait uh, how much uh, how much waste they receive, and then uh, but at least the using drone that give you some kind of volumes, and then you know uh, uh, we could probably come up with. Estimating some kind of density to come out with some something that makes sense to feed into the, the models, and uh, the uh, uh, and the other thing is uh, there are quite a few models out there, and and it's really uh, it's I, I I feel like you know sometimes you have to consider the fact that what you're going to use the information for, and then maybe then you can decide on which model you're going to use, and uh, the most of the uh, available, uh, like Langen, for instance, uh, IPCC. This, these are all free, uh, free and sweet. Uh, the the recent one is a sweet model. It's all free to download from the uh, from the either US US EPA and uh, website to, uh, for download free, and uh, you can use that uh, to come up with pretty good numbers. And uh, unless you have really uh, accurate site data. Uh, you you have to do quite a bit of guessing also, and then it's really depending on how experienced you are using those models, or at least the theoretical background of of the model itself is kind of important, I think. Um, did you have something to add? I kind of run out of thing to say here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, James. No, I just wanted to mention. Obviously, we didn't have time to go into it. Like, there's a lot of satellites monitoring greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, data mm -hmm. now, and this was in conversation with one such company to see whether we can work together on the closing dump sites task force. Um, mm -hmm. I saw a nifty little, uh, not a presentation, but uh, she showed me. I gave her some coordinates on Google Maps way back in December, mm -hmm. and she promised to come back with data. So one of the dump sites was the Perungudi dump site in uh, in Chennai, and another one that we are working in in uh, Baniwangi, and another one. In Chengalpet too, and she came back with data. It was so cool to see, um, you know, over the eight nine months that the satellite had been 
getting so Perungudi was big enough, 325 acres that it was actually measuring that data. Mm -hmm. And uh, she showed me concentrations. She showed me how, uh, you know, how the wind patterns are affecting the methane flows and so on. So going back to Oksana's question, I mean, um, you, as James explained, you know, we've been using, of course, analyzers and drones and so on. Uh, James uses that for his work um, quite on a daily basis. But with the closing dump sites task force, we're also looking to uh, take some help from the satellite data, which which seems really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely an evolving space. I can just add to that, like in, our, in Canada's case, we've spent, um, the government of Canada has put a lot of investment into improving um, our understanding of the measurement approaches for like, those, or whether it's for, you know, monitoring gas capture systems or simply trying to estimate what landfills may be emitting. So it, it's definitely an evolving space. I think US EPA is in the same category of trying to, you know, improve their understanding and use of the technology. So I think the measurement is going to become more important over time. Uh, but certainly the modeling and everything gives us a starting point, as James said. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I guess, you know, following along from there, you know, what strikes me about this, this conversation we're having is like, things are bad, right? Like we can see from the data, there's a lot of challenges with waste. Um, but are they also getting better? You know, are things bad, but also getting better? Or are we still... Are we, you know, do you see, in other words, do you see more projects coming along that are trying to address these larger emitters or, you know, do you have a sense of that or is it, are we stagnant? Is it declining even in fact our action in this area? Where, where are you guys with that? Uh, I have, I have a little, a little bit mis feeling about this question uh, and, and try to figure out how to respond to this. Because we also run into a situation, you know, I mentioned in my presentation about mindset to get people to change how they behave is very difficult, at least in our generation. Maybe the two, three generation after when we provide enough education to them, they will, re they will realize that, hey, you know, it's better to do sanitary landfill and not dump site operations. Okay. So we, we ran into a situation that people move away from dump site to sanitary landfill, but then for whatever reason, they move back to dump site operations just because, you know, few, few, uh, stakeholders didn't want to play along because it's too long of a haul or, or, you know, they don't realize much benefit of doing that. So, you know, I think, uh, some of the top point we have that we didn't really go into deep into it because, uh, stakeholders, you know. Get to, uh, involvement day 1 of any project is very important. At least you get them to buy in and then they stick to the plan. So mm -hmm. that. So that I think then you will see some significant, uh, 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 improvement moving in the right direction because. You know, uh, I think I, I can say this because I see enough dump site operating in, around the world at this point that. Some of the site is really heartbreaking, you know. And uh, you, you just cannot believe that you can have 1500 people uh, day, every day living on the landfill, try to try to make a livelihood out of it. So it's, it's uh, something more can be done. But we as an organization, we have limited uh, resource. I wish someone who is listening out there would give you a few few million dollars to do sort of project to improve <laughs> to, to improve uh, our current waste management situation uh, worldwide. Yeah, well, you know, maybe on that that topic of of who pays, basically the financing part about it. Um, in the projects you've seen move forward, like who who's who's kind of covering the costs? Is it the local governments? Is it national? Um, or you know, are 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 there sources of funding where? You know, when you connect these dots, like we're talking about the, 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 the social, the environmental and everything lines up, uh, you know, are, is there sources of funding that are helping bring it forward from there? Uh, Aditi, you want to start first? Sure. Um, so these bigger projects, what we've seen is uh, multilateral development agencies or big banks fund those. 
uh, when it comes to like closing a very big dump site, moving to a landfill and so on. Um, so going to, hi, Yobel, going to his funding question. Um, of course, it can, you know, there are so many ways to fund these kind of projects. Uh, not easy, but of course, national governments could be one. It could be in terms of grants and aid coming from, as I said, multilateral development agencies, multilateral uh, organizations like the UN, uh, but also giving you the example of India, because this is where I'm living right now. Um, we've also seen public private partnerships really play a big role. So a big company uh, that's managing waste in several cities is perhaps uh, looking to uh, you know, showcase their technology. And in India, I don't know, it's one of the questions that came in, but um, in India, what we've seen is that a lot of old legacy dump sites are being bio-mined. Uh, it's probably like an oxymoronic word, bio-mined, because there's nothing bio much remaining in that and no. also not many recyclables. And we've been skeptical, uh, but, you know, uh, have been trying, uh, people have been trying to convince us otherwise. Uh, so a lot of that is happening and there's there's funds in that because cities and municipalities don't want legacy dump sites within their boundaries. So uh, funding is coming again, as I said, from public private partnerships where a private company says, hey, we'll get rid of your, you know, we'll make it disappear. Okay, we'll, you give us some money, we put in some of ours or our own. Uh, but then the more innovative things that we've been discussing also at COP, which of course our presentation didn't go into much, was uh, carbon credits and green financing. And in at the COP, uh, we discussed um, something called methane credits, because uh, as we saw in both our presentations, methane as a molecule is a much more potent as a greenhouse gas contributor than CO2. So uh, perhaps there has to be a distinction between, you know, projects that are actually working to mitigate methane as opposed to just carbon. Uh, and there, uh, if you look at the Paris Agreement, it has uh, Article 6, which talks about, you know, voluntary uh, mitigation of, like, basically countries are allowed to trade uh, carbon between themselves uh, as a way to reaching their nationally determined contributions. So that's one, uh, hopefully, you know, a pathway for people to get funding into these kind of projects, closure projects. When you make the case for methane mitigation, then you, uh, you, you know, market-based mechanisms can come into play, um, and that's where the funding can come from, too. So there are many ways, but as James mentioned, we we found it challenging too as a as a task force to get funding for this, uh, because I think the task force is harder to fund. We need to get projects on the ground, and that's going back to Derek's question whether you know things have changed since 2018. Um, we're seeing things change, and we're seeing more and more players uh, acknowledge that these things have to be done. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great. Uh place where we'll have to end it, actually. I see that we're coming to the end of our time. But uh, yeah, I echo the sentiment there that it seems to me, you know, in all the years I've worked on this, that I've never seen more attention on the issue of, of waste sector methane. And, uh, and, and therefore, you know, if we can keep that attention, but also get some of those resources directed at solving the problems, we can see all kinds of other benefits, right? Social yes. benefits, other environmental benefits. So like it's a, there's a, you know, let's say it's the methane moment, but hopefully it's the waste management moment. Let's see if that can be true. So Absolutely. I, I want to thank everybody. And thanks James and Aditi uh, thank for, you. For, for these great presentations. Um, I think Catherine Rush, did you, did you have, um, oh, a final slide. Yeah, so there it is. Pardon me. On the screen, you'll see those in attendance uh, upcoming webinar. Uh, the date is coming soon. Uh, if I could kindly ask you, folks attending today, if you found this interesting, you found this helpful, um, if you could think about who else in your network might also find such such a, an event useful, and maybe next time you receive a message about our upcoming webinar, you could forward it to them, and so we could kind of grow our network a little bit further. Um, okay, so I guess with that, we'll, we'll close the, the session. So thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye for now. Thanks, Matt. Thank okay. you. Bye, thanks Matt. All. Bye, Catherine. Bye. Linda.